John Burroughs in the Hemlocks, Part 3. An hour afterward I approach the place, find all still, and the mother bird upon the nest. As I draw nearer she seems to sit closer, her eyes growing large with an inexpressibly wild, beautiful look. She keeps her place till I am within two paces of her when she flutters away as at first. In the brief interval the remaining egg has hatched, and the two little nestlings lift their heads without being jostled or overreached by any strange bedfellow. A week afterward they were flown away so brief in the infancy of birds, and the wonder is that they escape even for this short time the skunks and minks and muskrats that abound here and that have a decided partiality for such tidbits have a decided partiality for such tidbits. I pass on through the old bark peeling now threading an obscure cow path or an overgrown wood road now clambering over soft and decayed logs or forcing my way through a network of briars and hazels now entering a perfect bower of wild cherry, beech, and soft maple now emerging into a little grassy lane golden with buttercups or white with daisies or wading waist-deep in the red raspberry bushes. Whirr, 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 and a brood of half-grown partridges start up like an explosion a few paces from me and scattering disappear, disappear in the bushes on all sides. Let me sit down here behind the screen of ferns and briars and hear this wild hen of the woods call together her brood. At what an early age the partridge flies. Nature seems to be to concentrate her energies on the wing, making the safety of the bird a point to be looked after first. And while the body is covered with down, no signs of feathers are visible, the wing quills sprout and unfold, and in an incredibly short time the young make far fair headway in flying. The same rapid development of wing may be observed in chickens and turkeys, but not in waterfalls, nor in birds that are safely housed in the nest till full-fledged. The other day by a brook I came suddenly upon a young sandpiper, a most beautiful creature, enveloped in a soft gray down, swift and nimble and apparently a week or two old, but with no signs of plumage of either body or wing, and it needed none, for it escaped me by taking to the water as readily as if it had flown with wings. Hark! There arises over there in the brush a soft, perasive, persuasive cooing, a sound so subtle and wild and unobtrusive that it requires the most alert and watchful ear to hear it. How gentle and solicitous and full of yearning love! It is the voice of the mother hen, presently a faint timid yeep, which almost eludes the ear is heard in various directions, the young responding. As no danger seems near, the cooing of the parent bird is soon a very audible clucking call, and the young move cautiously in the direction. Let me step n never so carefully from my hiding place, and all sounds incessantly cease, and I search in vain for either parent or young. The partridge is one of our most native and characteristic birds. The woods seem good to be in where I find him. He gives a ha habitable air to the forest, and one feels as if the rightful occupant was really at home. The woods where I do not find him seem to want everything, want something as if suffering from some neglect of nature, and then he is such a splendid success, so hardy and vigorous. I think he enjoys the cold and the snow. His wings seem to rustle with more fervency in midwinter. If the snow falls fat, very fast and promises a heavy storm, he will complacently sit down and allow himself to be snowed under. Approaching him at such times, he suddenly bursts out of the snow at your feet, scattering the flakes in all the directions and goes humming away through the woods like a bombshell, a picture of native spirit and success. His drum is one of the most welcome and beautiful sounds of spring. Scarcely have the trees expanded their buds when in the still spring April in the still April morning or toward nightfall you hear the hum of his devoted wings. He selects not as you would predict a dry and resinous log, 
but a decayed and crumbling one, seeming to give the pre preference to old oak logs that are partially blended with the soil. If a log to his taste cannot be found, he sets up his altar on a rock, which becomes a resonant beneath his fervent blows. Who has seen the partridge drum? It is the next thing to catching a we weasel asleep, though by much caution and tact it may be done. He does not hug the log, but stands very erect, expands his ruff, gives two introductory blows, pauses half a second, and then resumes striking faster and faster till the sound becomes a continuous, unbroken whirr, the whole lasting less than half a minute. The tips of his wings barely brush the log so that the sound is produced rather by the force of the blows upon the air and upon his own body as in flying. One log will be used for many years, though not by the same drummer. It seems to be a sort of temple and held in great respect. The bird always approaches on foot and leaves it in the same quiet manner, unless rudely disturbed. He is very cunning, though his wit is not profound. It is difficult to approach him by stealth. You will not. You will try many times before succeeding, but seem to pass by him in great hurry, making all the noise possible, and with plumage furled he stands as immovable as a knot, allowing you a good view and a good shot if you are a sportsman. Passing along one of the old bark peelers' roads which wander aimlessly about, I am attracted by a singularly brilliant and emphatic warble proceeding from the low bushes and quickly suggesting the voice of the Maryland yellow throat. Presently the singer hops up on a dry twig and gives me a good view. Lead-colored head and neck becoming nearly black on the breast, clear olive-green back and yellow belly. From his habit of keeping near the ground, even hopping upon it occasionally, I know him to be a ground warbler. From his dark breast, the ornithologist has added the expletive mourning, hence the mourning ground warbler. Of this bird, both Wilson and Audubon confess their comparative ignorance, neither ever having seen its nest or become acquainted with its haunts and general habits. Its song is quite striking and novel, though its voice at once suggests the class of warblers to which it belongs. It is very shy and wary flying but a few feet at a time and studiously concealing itself from your view. I discover but one pair here. The female has food in her beak, but carefully avoids betraying the locality of her nest. The ground warblers all have one notable feature, very beautiful legs, as white and delicate as if they had always worn silk stockings and satin slippers. High tree warblers have dark brown or black legs and more brilliant plumage, but less musical ability. The chestnut sided belongs to the latter class. He is quite common in these woods, as in all the woods about. He is one of the rarest and handsomest of the warblers. His white breast and throat, chestnut sides, and yellow crown show conspicuously. Last year I found the nest of one in an up lying beech wood in a low bush near the roadside where cows passed and browsed daily. Things went on smoothly till the cow bunting stole their egg into it, when other mishaps followed and the nest was soon empty. A characteristic attitude of the male during this season is a slight drooping of the wings and a tail, a little elevated which gives him a very smart bantam-like appearance. His song is fine and hurried, and not much of itself, but has its place in the general chorus. A far sweeter strain, falling on the ear with a true sylvan cadence, is that of the black-throated green-backed warbler whom I meet at various points. He has no superiors among the true Sylvia. His song is very plain and simple, but remarkably pure and tender, and might be indicated by straight lines thus. The first two marks representing two sweet silvery notes in the same pitch of voice and quite unaccented. The latter marks the concluding notes wherein the tone and inflection are changed. The throat and breast of the male are a rich black like velvet, his face yellow and his back a yellowish green. Beyond the back bark peeling, when the woods are mingled 
where the woods are mingled hemlock, beech, and birch, the languid midsummer note of the black-throated blueback falls on my ear. Twee, 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 in the upward sigh, slide, and with peculiar zing of summer insects, but not destitute of certain plaintive cadence. It is one of the most languid, unhurried sounds in all the woods. I feel like reclining upon the dry leaves at once. Audubon says he has never heard his love song, but this is all the love song he has, and he is evidently a very plain hero with his little brown mistress. He assumes very few attitudes and is not a bold and striking gymnast like many of his kindred. He has a preference for dense woods of beech and maple, moves slowly amid the lower branches and smaller growths, keeping from eight to ten feet from the ground, and repeating now and then his listless, indolent strain. His back and crown are dark blue, his throat and breast black, his belly pure white, and he has a white spot on each wing. Here and there I meet the black and white creeping warbler, whose fine strain reminds me of a hair wire. It is unquestionably the finest bird song to be heard. Few insect strains will compare with it. In this respect, while it has none of the harsh, brassy character of the latter, being very delicate and tender. That sharp, uninterrupted, but still continued warble, which before one has learned to discriminate closely, he is apt to confound with the red, red-eyed vireos, is that of the solitary warbling vireo. A bird slightly larger, much rarer, and with a louder, less cheerful and happy strain. I see him hopping along lengthwise of the limbs, and note the orange tinge of his breast and sides, and the white circle around his eye. But the declining sun and the deepening shadows admonish me that the ramble must be brought to a close, even though only the leading characters in the chorus of forty songsters have been described, and only a small portion of the venerable old woods explored. In, ex in a secluded swampy corner of the old bark peeling, where I find the great purple orchis in bloom, and where the foot of man or beast seems never to have trod, I linger long, contemplating the wonderful display of lichens and mosses that overrun both the smaller and the larger growths. Every bush and branch and sprig is dressed up in the most rich and fantastic of liveries, and crowning all, the long-bearded moss festoons the branches or sways gracefully from the limbs. Every twig looks a century old, though green leaves tip the end of it. A young, a young yellow birch has a venerable patriarchal look and seems ill at ease under such premature honors. A decayed hemlock is draped as if by hands for some solemn f festival. Mounting toward the upland again, I pause reverently as the, lush, as the hush and stillness of twilight come upon the woods. It is the sweep, sweetest, ripest hour of the day, and as the hermit's evening hymn goes up from the deep solitude below me, I experience that serene exaltation of sentiment of which music, literature, and religion are but the faint types and symbols. 1865 In the Hemlocks by John Burroughs